Okay, so let's uh, talk about what we have left. I think I can say everything we have left. Um, so first, uh, exam four is on Monday. That's the 20th, I think. And the topics for that are everything up through circular motion. So there's only one new topic on this that wasn't on the last test. Um, And uh, today I can answer homework questions and also, you know, when you're done with questions, uh, I was just planning to do some circular motion problems, put some up and have you work on those and I'll go through them to sort of help you get ready for that. Um, there are no labs next week. That's good. Unless you like labs, then it's bad. <laughs> I know, I know you do. <laughs> um, and then the week after that is lab exam three. And at, when lab is over tonight, um, Everybody's done with labs for the semester. It's just uh, this test left. Um, so everything's on this test. And then uh, I believe there's a quiz that week. Um, So that's that week, I think. Yeah. yeah. So uh, 11.29, thanks. Yes. I also have a class on Thursday. <laughs> um. And then the next week is the uh, intuition post-test thing. That doesn't affect your grade, but um, give a little bit of extra credit for taking that because I don't have any leverage left to get you to take it otherwise. Um, <laughs> Uh, enough, enough to change someone's grade one letter grade really? if they have, if they, <laughs> if their grade is at a certain place. <laughs> um. Yeah, cause yeah, but don't do horrible. Yes, that's right. Just. If you take it, you get the points. But doesn't count your grade, no. But I'll put the the pretest scores are already on D2L, and I'll put the post test scores. So maybe you you're curious how all this lab nonsense helps you with that. Um, so hopefully, some is the answer. <laughs> That, that diagnostic intuition type test? Well, it's just sort of, uh, so the curriculum it, for physics, I don't know why other people do it, but um, this is all sort of based around doing these mathematical calculations. But the hope is sort of that as you're um, going through the math 
doing the problems. You're also building up this intuition about the way things work. Um, and, uh, you know, I use, I use that test to see how well that's developed. And then I started doing these labs to see if I could kind of help that intuition along. So I make decisions about what things I'm going to change in the labs and stuff like that based on how well overall people do, you know, over not, not based on like one semester really, but, um, overall, if I see it, like people are getting these kind of questions wrong, then we'd spend more time thinking about that kind of stuff. One of the problems on the lab? No, not in lab. It was last class. We were considering it was more static testing, but okay, uh, that was on the the Newton's laws problems. Yeah, you don't have to know that. That's residual from the way I used to teach the class. You can skip that problem. I just haven't taken that off of the practice problems yet. Next Wednesday, we don't. Uh, and I'm not doing office hours either, but it, that would be weird if I, I'd be surprised. <laughs> Who knows, though? So, um, oh, I'm not done with my list yet. I have one more thing on my list is the final, uh, exam five. And exam five, you have two options for taking it. The one that's, you know, Scheduled for the night class is Monday, uh, December 11th, I think, at 6 p.m. in this room. Um, but you could also take it, uh, the day class is scheduled for Thursday, I think that's the 14th, at 2 p.m. in the classroom over, 1328. So whichever one of those works for you, you can take that one. So if you feel like Monday comes and you need another couple days to study, you could clear up your schedules, you know, and, and come take it during the day. Mm -hmm. No, uh, the lab exam is the week after Thanksgiving. And the the intuition thing is the next week. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions about any of this? The end of the semester. Yes. I don't know yet. Uh, you know, uh, two with two, I could have a uniform circular motion problem and a non-uniform. So that's probably a good guess. But. Yes. I don't think I'm, well, no, I know because it's the last class is right now. I don't have the grades done for the last exam, so um, I should have a good bit of, well, I don't know. It's uh, getting stuff graded is back among my top priorities now, so that's all I can say. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um, anybody have any, I, you haven't had too long to look at the homework problems, but does anyone have any homework problems you'd like me to go through from circular motion? Okay. And here's a problem for you to work on. 
we'll do it in two parts. Uh, so let's say there's a Ferris wheel. And um, so this Ferris wheel is in uniform circular motion. Um, Passengers are moving at a speed of four meters per second, and the radius is what do you think the radius of a Ferris wheel is? Five meters, a big Ferris wheel, 20 feet. Radius is five meters. Um, what is the net force on a passenger at, let's say, point A? We'll do it down here later too, but let's just do this one first. So, um, oh, we need to know the mass of the passenger. Let's say the passenger has a mass of 100 kilograms. Okay, so work together on that. Ask me questions if you get stuck. Um, and after you you know, work on it for a while. I'll go through it and you can compare what you did. Um, then we'll do it for point B. Uh, and then after that, we'll do it for non-uniform when the Ferris wheel's slowing down. So first we choose the view that we're gonna take. That's where you can see the circle. And I'll use this coordinate system. And uh, sometimes we get to choose the point that we're interested in, but for this one, it's chosen for us. We want to look at that instant. So the centripetal acceleration points down. Um, the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration is v squared over r, which is uh, 16 fifths, so 3.2. That's in the negative y direction, so the Centripetal acceleration vector is zero, negative 3.2. This is uniform circular motion, so the tangential acceleration is zero. So the total acceleration vector is zero, negative 3.2. And now, normally you would draw a free body diagram. Um, if you're asked to calculate a net force, a free body diagram doesn't really help you because a free body diagram just is there for you to make sure you don't miss any individual forces. But if you're trying to lump all the forces into an F net anyways, you might as well just go straight to Newton's second law <coughs> and write it as Fx, Fy. For with F net, it doesn't help at all. So, right, but um, and so the net force is equal to 
the mass times the acceleration Uh, the x equation says fx is equal to zero. The y equation says fy is equal to negative 320. And so that total vector f net is equal to zero, negative 320. Um, now let's say what's the force vector applied to the passenger by the seat, okay? That's a slightly different question. And in that case, so here's the passenger. Um, a free body diagram has the weight acting down. That's 100 times 9.81, so 981. What? <coughs> I think you can sit either way. Oh, okay. Now his legs just bend like that. He's, he's very flexible. Um, okay, so here's Fx and Fy. So Newton's second law says 0, negative 981 plus Fx, Fy is equal to 100 times the acceleration, which was 0, negative 3.2. So fx is equal to 0, and fy is equal to 981 minus 320, which is 661. So the force vector on the passenger by the seat is zero, positive 661. Does it make sense that, uh, that the force the seat applies to the passenger is up? Yeah, um, if the seat wasn't pushing up on the passenger, he'd be in free fall, you know. So the seat is what's keeping him from accelerating down. Any questions about that? Okay, so now let's do the same thing again. For point B. Find F net and the force on the passenger by the seat. Okay, so this time, I'm going to go through all these steps again. So there's the circular path. Here's the point we're looking at now. The centripetal acceleration goes this way. The 
magnitude of the centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. So that's 3.2 again. This time that centripetal acceleration is in the positive y direction. So the centripetal acceleration vector is 0, positive 3.2. This is uniform circular motion, so there's no tangential acceleration. So the total acceleration is 0, 3.2. To calculate F net, Newton's second law says, you know, F net x and y components are equal to the mass times the acceleration. So fx is 0, fy is positive 320. <coughs> so f net is equal to 0, positive 320. Okay, so F net magnitude is the same uh, because for F net, all that, you know, we're not breaking it up into individual forces, so gravity isn't separated out. But now when we go to calculate the force vector applied to the passenger by the seat, we're going to see that things are different in this position because gravity has a different orientation with compared to the acceleration. So a free body diagram of the passenger. There's the weight, 981. And there's the two unknown force components. So that all looks just the same. Newton's second law says zero. Negative 981 plus the X and Y components of the force on the passenger by the seat is equal to 100 times the vector 0, 3.2. And so the x equation says fx is 0. The y equation says fy is 13.01. So the force on the passenger by the seat is 0. 1301. Okay, so when you're on a Ferris wheel, where are you most nervous about the Ferris wheel falling apart and you crashing to your death? Not at the top. Well, it would be much worse for you if it happened at the top, so that's good news, but uh, at the bottom it's more likely to happen because look at the magnitudes of these forces that are required from the seats. Um, so that's a very uh, uh, optimistic way to look at it. Like, when you're up the highest, you're the safest. You're the safest you can be on the whole ride. Um, what? Do you think that's too fast? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess... Yeah, like 10 miles per hour. You don't think you go 10 miles per hour on a Ferris wheel? No. Oh. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> I've been on them a lot. I don't know. I guess I just... <laughs> yeah, right. I was so scared the whole time. I assumed it was going really fast. <laughs> okay, well, with this unrealistic Ferris wheel, it's... 
more than twice as much force that's required when you're at the bottom than at the top. Okay, so now, nope, nope, if it was, if it was going one meter per second, there would be a very, very little difference between the forces, that's right. The directions would change, but the magnitudes wouldn't be very different. Because what's, what's happening here is the centripetal acceleration and the, and the weight force are either in the same direction, in which case uh, it lessens the force that's required, or they're in opposite directions, which increases. And so if the centripetal acceleration is really small because you're going slowly, then it doesn't increase the force much. Okay, so now let's say that uh, it's at the end and it's stopping. So it starts to slow down. at a rate of um, five meters per second squared. What's the force on the passenger by the seat at the point E? I just said it, I think I really just said it so for a second I could imagine how great that would be if, I, if it was true. Okay, so we're looking at this point here. Centripetal acceleration is this way. The magnitude is v squared over r. We're just doing this right at the instant that it starts to slow down, so that at that instant, the speed we're still going to assume is 4 meters per second. And this is still 3.2. And the direction is down, so this is zero, negative 3.2. But this time, there's also going to be a tangential acceleration. Let's see, which way is this rotating? OK. Um, it's rotating this way, so the velocity vector is this, if it's slowing down, that means that the tangential acceleration is opposite the velocity. So the tangential acceleration has a magnitude of five in the positive x direction. So this is five, zero. So the total acceleration is 0, negative 3.2, plus 5, 0. So that's 5, negative 3.2. A free body diagram. There's the weight of 981, and then the force with the unknown direction. That's the force applied by the seat. And so Newton's second law says Fx, Fy, plus 0, negative 981. is equal to the mass times the acceleration of 5, negative 3.20. Oh. 
the x equation says fx is equal to 500. And the y equation says fy is equal to, uh, that's got to be the 661. So together, this says the force on the passenger by the seat is equal to 500, 661. Any questions about that one? Where? Yeah. Okay, so we um, we figured out that the velocity was that way. And the analysis to figure out the direction is, um, to figure out the direction of the tangential acceleration is the same as like in lab when you're thinking about the direction of a parallel. If the thing's speeding up, then it's in the same direction as the velocity. If it's slowing down, it's in the opposite direction. And so then, once we knew it was in that direction, that's the positive x, and we came up with the components <laughs> for the vector. Okay, so we had a big increase in the force that, yeah, big increase in the force that was required because of the changing speed. Um, okay, let's do it one more time. Uh, same thing. But at point B. Oh, wait, how could it be just starting to slow down when the passenger is at A and just starting to slow down when the passenger is at B? Two different passengers. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so there's the circle. This time we're looking at this point. Centripetal accelerations this way. The magnitude is 3.2. So the centripetal acceleration vector is 0, 3.2. It's rotating this way. So um, the velocity is like this. So since it's slowing down, the tangential acceleration has to be the opposite direction. And that's the negative x direction. So the tangential acceleration is negative 5, 0. So the total acceleration is those two added together. So negative 5, positive 3.2. Free body diagram. There's 981 down. And then the force vector applied by the seat. Newton's second law says 0, negative 981. plus fx, fy, is equal to 100 times the vector negative 5, positive 3.2. So fx is equal to negative 500. fy is equal to positive 1301. And so the total force vector on the passenger 
I the seat is negative 500, positive 1301. So what's the force vector on the seat by the passenger? Not turn around, just, just switch the signs. Yep, so positive 500, negative 1301. And then that's the value that you would use if you're trying to figure out something about how much force these seats have to withstand. Since this is at the bottom of the, the bottom of the motion, this is where the most force is being applied. So for a passenger of this size, uh, the force on the seat would be positive 500, negative 1301. And then from that, you could, you know, calculate the stresses and what kind of metal you have to use and how thick and that kind of stuff. Any questions about any of those? Yep, just multiply the whole vector by negative one. So you're just switching to the exact opposite direction. Because that's Newton's third law. Uh, yeah, see you in lab.